Yeah, I think we both have a different experience as to how we got started. Uh, for me, I remember how I really started to move in that direction is I was looking at my practice and I says, okay, I'm working like a dog, not making a whole lot of money. But I figured this is just the nature of the beast. If you're going to be self-employed in practice, you got to be content with making this amount of money. And I still remember I was not that late into practice, not long before I had met you, that I had a client come in, he was an electrician, and he was making like $30,000. And he said, you know, there's just no way of making money as an electrician anymore. This is about the best I can do. It's, it's a doggy dog world, and I used to do a lot better, but now $30,000 a year is as good as it gets. And I remember thinking, well, it's kind of sad electricians have to go through this phase of not working, not making much money. Two weeks later, I had another electrician come in, and his profits were around $800,000. Working in the same city, under the same environment, under the same conditions, making $800,000 instead of thirty. dollars And I thought, okay, <laughs> this bullshit about it's dog-eat-dog -dog world and there's just no way to make more money. And then I realized, okay, what's the second guy doing that the first guy isn't? Then I realized I was more like the first guy. I'm con this is the way it is and this is what I'm stuck with and I realized it's all about how we look at our business and how we run it and I figured okay I gotta do better I think that's I think that's correct the way I looked at it came basically to the same point is that how come a car dealership in the same town the same environment or this a, a farm equipment dealership or an operation whether it was a, a trade or, or a store one store would go broke because they weren't making any money and the other operation would be incredibly successful. And by us knowing their financial situation, we would look at it and say, oh, I get the connection. These people offer this service, they treat people this well, and they charge this price and they make this much money. And these guys don't treat their people well, right? They don't look after their customers well and they don't operate or manage the business right. So they didn't make any money. And I found that the difference was not the environment, not the type of business, and so on. It was all management. So I got thinking, well, why wouldn't that apply to a public accounting firm? So I got the bug and I thought, well, I'm gonna go and learn how to properly manage the accounting firm. Not the technical side. Lots of accounting people are extremely good technically. How do they manage the practice? So that's how I got intentional about making the improvement in the business so that I was able to put those practices in place, which is a daunting task mm -hmm. right now. I mm -hmm. mean, to start doing it, we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. We grew up with it, so it, it, it's been with us for decades. So the people that are gonna attend the conference now are gonna go, oh, I can't do all this stuff. No, you need to be intentional. Take one step at a time. Go through all the things we're going to teach them. And you'll see that your management will become better at your practice. And then consequently, you're going to be in a better position to control your practice rather than the other way around. What was your first step? What was, how did you get from, okay, I can probably do better. I don't even know where to get the information on how to do better. How did you make that first step? Where did you come across for you to say, there's the place I need to be? or well, the person I, I need to talk to. Or. I, I knew there had to be some place that it was there. So I started scouring around Canada to see where there might be an opportunity to learn that. Well, I thought there would be bigger centers. I'm from a small town. I thought, well, okay, there'd be big centers that have it. No, I couldn't find anything that was really appealing there. I thought, well, there must be somebody in the United States that would do it. So I went and searched a whole bunch in the United States and I found a practitioner's uh, forum in San Diego. And I thought, ooh, like I'm from a small town. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go into San Diego was, like, you, gotta be, you gotta be kidding me. And then I got thinking, I'm not sure I can afford the money to go, and I sure as a heck couldn't afford to be away from the practice for three or four days at the conference, plus my travel time. And so it was a real gut-wrenching decision to go, I, I, I just have to go. This is going to change my life. And it clearly has. Okay. And do you, and I, we've never talked about this, but that first event that you went through, what were the f things that really kind of, wow, <laughs> do you remember some of those aha moments? Yeah, I, 
I think the ones that got me thinking the most were about all, all you people that don't want to keep track of time. And I haven't met a practitioner since this morning that didn't like to keep track of time. <laughs> is that that's what you have to do. And, and what are the ways we can keep track of time? How do we actually mine all of the information and all of the time that is in our time records? Well, if there's only you doing the job and doing the billing and doing the everything, well, you can remember most of that. But many firms today are not just one practitioner. They've got people that are helping them. They're people that are, are doing some of the work and more, more detailed work with the file. Well, how do you know what went on in the file? How is it different than last year? And I got thinking, well, that happens to us all the time, mm -hmm. right? So well, let's, start, let's start doing that. And uh, the one that blew me away, and I don't remember whether it was the first one or a subsequent uh, forum that I went to, and it was about value billing. And all accounting people are X hours times X rate gives me the bill. Mm -hmm. And then we would go, ooh, I can't charge that much. <laughs> so we would discount it. But we never looked at it the opposite way, saying, wow, I saved that that client this much money and I was able to save them that much money because of this and so my time in the file is not a glass ceiling 10 hours at 50 bucks five hundred dollars and say well, okay that's all I can bill no you look at it and go I saved them I remember one job that I saved them about seventy thousand dollars now this is back 20 25 years ago saved them $70,000 $70, and we had about 2,500 bucks in the file. And I went, well, the reason that we saved them the $70,000 was because of all the other experiences that we had. And so why would I not get paid for that? It was easy for me to say, well, I don't get paid for these previous ones because I really didn't, I really didn't spend the time or I, I, my customer couldn't afford to pay for it or whatever. Well, in this particular case, they could afford to pay for it. We saved them 70 grand, we had $2,500 in the file. So that's when my first taste of value billing mm -hmm. came in and I went, all of the customers look at the bill from a value point of view. Yeah. So why don't I look at it from a value point of view and bill accordingly? The first experience I had was at the ACP was in uh, Vegas, and I still remember the first thing that kind of hit me is there's 1,400 people here, all accountants, and I still remember starting to talk and we had roundtable discussions, and I realized we all have the same challenges. And what really struck me is that it doesn't matter where you're from, whether it be Canada, and there's even uh, people, uh, people from Mexico at our firm, at our table and it says we all have the same challenges it's all the same and I realize practice management is is universal it's, it's it comes as the whole world it seems with the problems we have and I still remember uh, oh hell at the end of the first day thinking I could go home now and learn nothing more and I've got more than my money's worth the, I, the ideas that came out of the woodwork of those of those speakers and uh, even the camaraderie with talking with other practitioners, the ideas that I got, right. that was almost as valuable as the conference itself as in the, 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 the presentation that's to be able to meet the other practitioners. It was unbelievable. Yeah, so two, two points on that. One, if it was as good a learning experience by being at home and watching it on the computer or getting a recording of it, then nobody would travel. Mm -hmm. There would be no more forums. They would all be held at a distance. Yeah. Right, um, And the other part that gets me is that maybe it was the fact that I was in a rural environment, the other firms in the area, there was one very large firm and many, many small firms, is that you, you think, well, maybe this is just because I'm in, in a rural setting and I'm maybe more secluded. Well. You, then you talk to people like you from the city and go, well, he's got the same problem, right? And then you talk to people from larger centers, right? Whether it's in Canada or the United States, they got the same problem in Boston at the accounting firm there as what they do in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. 
So what, what's preventing us from taking advantage of all this knowledge? And many people I found were all, all too willing to encourage you to, to share some of their journey. So you go, okay, I'm, I'm not the only one that feels this way. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one that feels like I'm kind of out on an island by myself. Yeah. So one of my favorite lines is, if you take a look at the boat, the boat that goes from this side of the river to that side of the river, take a look at the seat. It's well worn. You're not the first one to be in it. <laughs> and that's really what it amounts to is, you know, we've, we've been doing this now for decades. But the reality is there's still people that are on this side of the river and want to get to the other side yeah. and don't want to get in the boat, don't yeah. want to make the transition, be intentional about trying to get to the other side. Yeah. And for me, it, it's kind of funny. I still remember, you know, attending conferences and, and I, I would attend a ton of conferences on taxes and all that because it, it improved my skills. And I figured if I can improve my skills, I can probably make a, f a few more dollars. Uh, then we got on the subject of value billing when I started working with you, and then I really realized, holy man, the knowledge that I can get can really be capitalized into dollars very, very nicely. Um, but I still remember one of the things I appreciated in working with you, especially at first as a mentor, is that I always felt so alone, and you touched a little bit about that. I thought I was the only one who was having all these problems, because I go to these conferences and talk to other accountants, and they go, oh yeah, well, I don't have that problem anymore. And I was okay. Well, I must be the only stupid one around because right. it's, it, 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 and I, I think it, it may come with just being an accountant, where accountants have a hard time, I think, showing vulnerability, and so I found that I felt so alone. And I remember one of the things that was really refreshing in meeting with you is I would go, "Well, here are all the things that I'm struggling with." He says, "Yeah, I get that," and then you would share some of your experiences. Is, holy shit, Grant is really successful, and he had those problems. So it's not only me, and there are solutions, but he had to really struggle through those things like I did, and that was really refreshing to know that I wasn't an idiot. It's just the nature of the beast that we need to work through it, and that to me was, whew, was so, and that's the part that I really, I think. Yeah, but we, we see that in our clients, Yeah. right? I mean, I, I, think of, I think of one, I've got a brother that's got two or three, two or three tickets, right? Gas ticket plumbing ticket, tinsmith ticket, and so on. And I was working with him on his business, and I thought, he went to school, and they taught him to be a very skilled tradesman. And he was. The problem with it is they never taught him how to run the business. Yeah. So if we think back to our all of our accounting and finance and everything other course that we seem to have taken for what, what, what appeared to be decades, is that what did they ever teach us about running an accounting firm? They didn't even teach us some of the things that we needed to do to, to run a good business. Mm -hmm. So where, where are we going to get that? Well, you have to find somebody that's going to teach you and to train you and work with you. And that's why I think the mentorship side works where it's like the weight loss. We, we have many times in our life where we want to lose 20 pounds. Well, we don't lose, we didn't gain the 20 pounds overnight, we're not going to lose them overnight. We have to be very programmed and focused how we're going to lose one pound at a time. And Because it's the, exactly. And the next pound is the most important pound. It's not the 20th pound, it's the next one. And that's what we have to do here, is we have to, we have to work together. That's what the mentorship is that, that is offered, is to work together with somebody who will kind of hold your feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like having their feet held to the fire. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Yeah. Sometimes I don't like it either, but my <laughs> wife says I should. <laughs> so, so that, but the point is that you need to you 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 will find that the success is faster, it's higher, and better when you're when you're working with somebody who can actually lead you and train you and teach you. Yeah. The same as some people go and take golf lessons. Yeah. Well, why, do you, why don't you just learn how to golf by yourself? Yeah. Because you can learn to get better, faster, and you can reach a higher level of golf skill by having somebody teach you. That's mm -hmm. really what the mentorship is. Yeah. And, and you touched on something uh, a little bit earlier today when we had talked, is that... Um, oh, I should have lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh, about the tenacity and... Um, I still remember, uh, you know, you, you uh, saying certain things. Well, Changi, here's what you need to do. 
And I go, you are out of your mind, Grant. You think I'm going to do this? And now the funny part is I am now working with practitioners and telling them the same thing and they're going the exact same thing and asking the same questions I used to ask and being in disbelief says, you want me to do what? But what I found is interesting is how different people react differently. Uh, there are certain practitioners where I'm going to say, here's what you need to do and you can tell they have no intentions of, of doing it. And there are others who are like me who are saying, okay, I don't like it. You're going to have to sell me on it. And I would keep drilling you with questions until you convinced me. Because I kept thinking, if he wants me to do this, there's got to be a reason I just don't like what I'm hearing. And I think part of the reason I think my mentorship with you worked so well is part of it because, uh, like you said, I was tenacious. and says, oh, shit, he wants me to do what? And I would keep pressing you. <laughs> okay, Grant, I don't get it. I gotta, you got to sell me on that. I don't know if you remember those discussions yeah. <laughs> as well as I do, because I'm the one who is suffering the pain. Well, very much remember them. And, <laughs> and when I would say them to you, you go, oh, you want me to do what? <laughs> like, there's no way. And I would say, well, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> right? When right. I'd go to the conferences and try and learn how to do this, then I would go, oh, I, can't, I can't. I'm from rural, I'm from rural Manitoba. Yeah. There's not a chance I can get away with doing that. Yeah. I'm not going to have any customers left. Yes, exactly. They're all leaving. So when I would tell you, you'd say the same thing. Oh, I, got, I can't do that. Well, then after a while, it's, it's exactly like when you're, when you're working with your child, is that after a while, when you have repeated successes, so I would say, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this. And it wasn't as if, Look, you're going to darn well do it. Mm -hmm. No, it's you're you are are participating in this process. You had to buy in. So you'd ask me the questions, push back a little bit, and I'd say, "Well, okay, well, tell you what. Try it. Yeah. Humor me. Just try it." <laughs> and then you'd come back and say, "I can't believe how that worked." <laughs> and then the next time I went to tell you to try something, you'd go, "I don't like it, but the last time <laughs> what you told me last time worked." Yeah. And I'll try it again, but I don't think it's going to work. And then you go, it worked, it worked. again. <laughs> <laughs> and so after yeah. you get after yeah. you get a bunch of positive feedbacks like yeah. like that, when that feedback comes in, you go, okay, I'm I'm a little more eager, yeah. less resistance because there's a proven track record. And, and the other part that I found so difficult is, uh, and whether I come in as a mentoree or as a mentor, is so much is so counterintuitive. There's so many things you told me to do, and I says you're out of your mind. Okay. It's not what I've been taught in school, in life, and all of that. Like the whole thing about raising fees. Um, for that, I was scared because we were always taught, well, if you charge lower fees, you're going to get more clients. So you can't raise your fees; otherwise, you're going to lose your clients. That's what we're kind of always taught. And then we realized, no, actually, by increasing fees, I almost got more clients because I was able to divulge better and. Uh, service and all of that that came with that was really weird. Well, the other part of that, that's a good point. That's part of how you can get more clients. The other part is that there are people out there that are not looking for an eight-year-old Prius. They're not looking for a 10-year-old truck. So what they're looking for is somebody that is professional, knowledgeable, interested in their well-being, and cares about them. Well, if I was charging, I always like to use $100. If I was charging $100 and the market was saying that was worth $250, then you know what my line is. That tells me that you know your market value more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So if you're only worth 100 and everybody else is in the $200 range, you're the one that's wrong. You're the one that's not as clever. You don't think you're that good or you put your price where it needs to be. So when we go through that and we talk to our clients and tell them, we know we charge $200. In fact, the perfect line is that my guy is really good, but he's a little bit expensive. Yeah. Right? Or she's really good, but she's a little bit expensive. And so when you tell people that you're only charging $100 when the market's two or their perception of of it is because their friends paying 200 and this friends paying 200 and they've got huge respect for them mm -hmm. they run bigger businesses they maybe think they're smarter than than uh, than your client so the guy goes well if they're paying 200 and they're paying 200 their guy must be way better mm -hmm. their gal must be way better mm -hmm. because my gal or my guys only paying charging me a hundred bucks mm -hmm. 
that's that's a, a large part of the problem is that we we have a, a belief that lower fees will bring more customers and I think it will just the wrong customer yeah yeah and, and something you touched about about the glass ceiling and I still remember it took a couple of years and me working with you before my numbers really started showing there was some small progress but not terribly big but I still remember I think it was about the third year in where I really started seeing some huge progress in my numbers and I still remember meeting with you in Edmonton and I've shown you my financial statement that I think in that year I had made about $100,000 of profit. I finally hit the six figures and keep in mind this is several years ago so it was worth even more. I still remember thinking, oh man, I was so impressed with my numbers. I said, look at this crap, I made $100,000. And you went, yeah, it's okay. And I'm thinking, okay, are you freaking kidding me? Okay? And I remember that you then just ripped a, sh uh, a page out of that and just went totally nuts about all the things I was doing wrong, just looking at my financial statements and thinking, holy shit, the potential that I've got, because I've done all these things wrong. And, and I remember- And, and still made 100,000. And still made 100,000, yeah. And I remember going back home and Lisa said, so how was the meeting? He says, well, part of it was really, really discouraging because I think I did nothing right. But the encouraging part is, is just the potential if I correct all those things. I still remember the following year I had gone from like a hundred to 160,000. Like, who dreamed of having that kind of a raise? And I still remember thinking, oh, this year Grant's really got to be impressed. And I remember you saying, yeah, it's better than last year. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the extent of it. It's just, holy shit, he's still not impressed. <laughs> Again, I had this glass ceiling, right? So when I hit the 160, I thought, well, okay, the glass ceiling was at 100, but clearly it's at 160. And then when you looked at it with kind of, uh, I do realize, holy crap, the potential is not even here. And I still remember the following year, I think it was like a quarter of a million. And then, oh my God, like the progress and the speed in which I'm increasing my profits is just mind blowing. And the reaction was still the same. And, that, and, and I think it's about the third year when I hit about a quarter million dollars and your reaction was still kind of blood. <laughs> that I realized there's no limit. There's no limit as to what I can earn with this practice if I keep doing things better and keep working at it. And that was a phenomenal experience to go through that. And uh, I don't know if you remember those, man. I, I, I would have liked to think I was more encouraging. But. <laughs> no, you were. It's just that you were then showing me, here's the potential now. Imagine if you did this, this, here's what your bottom line could be. And I said, holy crap. And that's exactly why, you know, it was... It's a phenomenal experience. Well, part of it is that ex exactly the glass ceiling. That part of it is that we believe that a top-notch accounting person, right, she's only going to make this much. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is that's not right. Agreed. Right. And so we would. And part of the reason why we put the glass ceiling on ourselves is that we go to practitioners' meetings or whatever happens, yeah. or we're at, we're at, a, at a, an accounting standards course or something. And we get talking with our friends and our colleagues. And they say, oh, I had a really good year. I made this much money. And I made this much money. And that becomes what we want to put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we go, well, why do we have a glass ceiling? Yeah. Because the potential is so large. And there's people sitting there watching us going, really? Those guys think I'm going to believe that yeah. they made that kind of money? Yeah. Believe it. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's all possible. It you just need to be intentional, yeah. get yourself a plan, where do I want to go? And the other part that always amazed me about this is that not only when I increase the profit from the business, right? So I could have more, more I could have more money to expand, I could have more money for personal enjoyment, rewards, those sorts of things. But guess what else happens? It increases the value of the firm. Exactly. So if you're thinking at all about selling in the next three to five years, this is a no-brainer. You need to get the profit as high as you can, get as much efficiency in the operation to get the maximum value for your practice. Don't start on it six months in advance. You've already they, these people have already told their clients. Don't mm -hmm. try and sell your car dealership. Don't try and sell your plumbing business. You know, six months from now, you need to you need yeah, to get it prepared to sell it. Yeah. And we need to do the same with our own firm. But in the meantime, if you're not going to uh, plan on selling for 20 years, you may as well have a better crop all the way along. 
Why would you not want a better crop? Exactly. So then uh, let's turn around and get a get a better profitability picture. Yeah. And the other thing I think it did with the whole um, mentorship is not only were you very critical, and, and I mean this in a very positive way, about how I operated and really helped me look at my numbers in a different way, but what I really appreciated is the accountability of it all. Because I don't know how many times a decision would come around and says, oh, i got to go left or i got to go right. Left would be so much easier. And I said, oh, if I go left, Grant's going to eat me alive. Okay, I'm going to go right. And it's amazing, even as an adult, having my own business, I still have the teacher-student mentality. Like, I don't want to do my homework because I don't want the teacher to, uh, right. to give me shit, you know. And it's amazing how that feeling never goes away, even as an adult. Right. Um, it was important for me to know that I could, that you weren't going <laughs> to beat me up and eat me up and spit me out, but to maybe some way impress you. And it's amazing how that is, even... Because it was my benefit, it was for my own benefit, not for yours. Yeah. And it's amazing how the mind is really weird when it comes to that. Yeah, which is a little bit like a weight loss thing. Yeah, exactly. The, you know? the the other side is that you would you would sit there, and you would go, okay, this is what I think I should do. But if I was to call Grant, he what would he do? What was he likely going to tell me? And I so then you'd call me. And you'd say, "What do you? This is what I've got. What do you think I should do?" And I'd say, "Well, sometime at the first, I would give you the answer. Mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, this is what I think you should do.' I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. I, I thought that's what you were going to tell me, right? And then, and then after we did it for a while, yeah. then I would say, "What do you think we should do?" Right? Because that yeah. transition has to come where the first time I was, I was basically confirming what you yeah. had in mind. And then you said what you wanted to do, what you thought was best, and I'd go, absolutely spot on. Yeah. Right? How about just a little, yeah, a little tweak? A little tweak, and how about this way? Oh, good idea. Yeah. Right? And then away you go. Yeah. And that's part of this mentorship is that I've worked with other people, other accounting firms, uh, many of them not as successful as what you have been. And the point there is that they got some of the information and they took their profit from $100 to $120 or $150, never having believed they were going to get to $125, mm -hmm. but now we're at $150. And then they would go, well, I'm good. That's good. I'm above average. Yeah. I'm cool. Yeah. Okay, well, if you want to do that, that's fine. But you and I, we're not happy about above average. Right? Mm -hmm. That That's just not who we are. So we would want to go further 